Welcome once again to Dialogue on Public Issues. I'm John Chowney with Campbellsville University. And today I'm very pleased to once again be hosting a gentleman that is no stranger to our community and region, uh, the Honorable James Comer, our first district congressman from Kentucky. Welcome, James. Good to see you again. Good to Dr. see Chowney. you. I appreciate you taking time. Uh, as My we pleasure. do this interview, it's during the August recess. Uh, how are things going? Great, great. I'm uh, learning my way around Washington. I have a good relationship with President Trump. I think we've made some progress, but there's a whole lot of work left to be done in Washington. Uh, <clears throat> as as you, this, during this August recess, and you go back, what, after Labor Day? Yes, sir. What are some of the top issues on the on the table, so to speak, that Congress is looking at that you'll be facing when you go back? The biggest issue is one near and dear to me, it's the Farm Bill. Mm -hmm. The Farm Bill is a piece of legislation that has to pass every five years. This is the Farm Bill year. The current Farm Bill expires September 30th. So for a bill to become a law, it has to pass the House, the Senate, and the mm -hmm. President sign it into law. The House passed a version of the Farm Bill. The Senate passed a different version. So where we are now with the Farm Bill is they've appointed a conference committee, which is mm -hmm. a few members of the House, a few members of the Senate, to try to get a consensus to iron out the differences. And I'm fortunate to be on the conference committee. I'm a, what's called a conferee. Right. And we're negotiating, trying to get an agreement. And our goal is to vote on the Farm Bill the, the second to third week of September and have it on the president's desk before September 30th. Mm -hmm. Now that, that's fairly unusual for a freshman congressman yes. uh, to be on a conference committee right. on such an important piece of legislation. Yeah. I'm, I'm real honored. This is, the, uh, this is the biggest piece of legislation we'll pass in mm -hmm. Congress this year. Last year it was the Tax Cuts and Jobs right. Act. This year it'll be the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill doesn't just affect agriculture. It's right. also the food policy. All your uh, school nutrition programs at the public schools, the, the SNAP programs, which we used to call food stamps, all mm -hmm. that's funded in the Farm Bill, along with a lot of other things. So uh, this is a, a major piece of leg legislation. I'm the first conferee from Kentucky mm -hmm. in the House since 1990. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm honored to do that. Agriculture is, you know, my background. Right. There right. are only, uh, I think, six members of Congress that are farmers. And this is, uh, this is something that I think is going to be very positive for Kentucky, and I'm excited about it. Now, in, in the context of how that bill will affect the local farmer in mm -hmm. Taylor County, Greene right. County, uh, and, and other areas of the, Greene County is not right. in your district, but Marion right. County, Casey right. County, Absolutely. and Dare County. Yeah, well, it, it affects every grain farmer that purchases federal crop insurance. Mm -hmm. If they go to the Farm Service Agency and purchase uh, crop insurance, uh, tobacco farmers, uh, there are uh, programs for fruit and vegetable growers or programs for beginning farmers. You know, we recognize the fact that the average age of farmer now is, is over 58 years yeah. old. We need more next generation farmers. We need more younger farmers to, to be able to produce the food that we need to survive. So we're, we have programs to help young farmers get mm -hmm. started. And uh, also the extension office, the, the cooperative extension okay. offices, those are funded through uh, partially through the Farm Bill because they fund the research universities, which is the University of Kentucky. Uh, there's, there's also Murray State University, which is in my congressional district. Mm -hmm. They get a little bit of research dollars in the Farm Bill. All the conservation programs. Uh, there are a lot of people in this area that are involved in the CREP program and the mm -hmm. Conservation Reserve programs. Those are all uh, funded through the, the Farm Bill. So it, it's very important for agriculture. The last time the Farm Bill was written, five years ago, Corn prices, for example, were seven dollars and, and fifty cents mm -hmm. a bushel. Now they're around three dollars and seventy-five cents a bushel. Same with soybeans. D tobacco has has fallen way down. So the the commodity prices when the last farm bill passed were significantly higher than they are today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's imperative that we have a stable federal crop insurance program or the local community banks, right. the ag lenders. They're going to be a little hesitant to provide credit. For our farmers. Most farmers are like small business owners. They have to take a line of credit out at the beginning of the year and then pay it off as soon as they, they sell their crop. So uh, there's a lot that hinges on the farm bill and I think we're going to have a good farm bill for mm -hmm. agriculture. You know, I think your point's well taken. The farm economy, the ag economy right now, that local farmer, mm -hmm. these are fairly tough times for them. Yes. And I'm not sure the general public has quite right realize that yet for for several years right. things were going pretty well yep. with grain prices absolutely and, such. and and probably of all the different crops in kentucky the one that that in most peril today would be mm -hmm. dairy farmers right and there's still right. a lot of dairy farmers in this area mm -hmm. a lot unfortunately have gone out adair county's one of the biggest dairy counties in the state Barron county not far from here 
So we have language in the farm bill to help our dairy farmers. I don't know if it's gonna be enough help, mm -hmm. but it's some help. I was talking to a dairy farmer a friend of mine that I went to college with in Casey County uh, er, uh, earlier this week, and, and they thanked me for the language in the farm bill for mm -hmm. the dairy farmers and said that's gonna help a little bit. So it's a, it's a tough time to be a dairy farmer in Kentucky. Now what uh, other uh, bills, pot issues are on the table? Uh, right. that you're going to face as well. I, I'm a big proponent of welfare reform. Mm -hmm. We have a strong economy in America. In fact, as I travel the district in August and listen to the concerns of the business owners, the biggest concern right now for most employers is they can't find enough workers. Right. So there's never been a better time to get people off welfare mm -hmm. and into the workforce than today. I've used the Farm Bill to be a platform for welfare reform. I don't know if we're going to be able to get, get that mm -hmm. in the final version of the Farm Bill, but in the House, we passed work requirements on able-bodied men right. to work 20 hours a week. Uh, we also had worker training dollars in there. We've never had that in a Farm Bill before, but to try to help uh, some welfare recipients that are able-bodied, if they look like me, if they're mm -hmm. my age and they look like me and they don't have young children at home, dependents mm -hmm. at home, then let's try to get them in the workforce. Right. You know, welfare was never supposed to be a permanent program. Welfare right. was supposed to be a temporary safety net. Mm -hmm. And it's become an entitlement over the years. We have too many people that are being paid to not work, that can work. So I'm a big proponent of, of trying to enact welfare reform to get people off welfare and into the workforce. Also health care. Uh, the first year I was in Congress last year, we tried to repeal Obamacare. That passed the House. It did not pass the Senate. Remember, everyone remembers when McCain went in and went mm -hmm. like that and the bill went down in flames. So what the president's trying to do now is pick off different sections of health care. Uh, he's focusing on the prescription drug prices now. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of diabetics in, in my congressional district. My diabetes runs on my mom's side. Insulin's a perfect example of, of a drug that has just seen the price skyrocket. Insulin's been around for years and years right. and years. There's no reason to have the inflation in insulin that we've had. Mm -hmm. I think we have big drug companies that are gouging, that are taking advantage of the consumer. So there are some things that are gonna have to be done to get the cost of prescription drugs under control. Uh, we're working to get, to make associational health plans mm -hmm. a viable option for this coming January when, when people start to uh, sign up for the next health insurance. So if you're a member of the Farm, if you're a Farm Bureau and you're a member of the Farm Bureau, or if you're a, a, a home builder and you're a member of the Home Builders Association, if you all want to pull together mm -hmm. and have your own group health insurance plan, uh, that is a cheaper option than what we currently have because what we currently have is, is a scenario where there are only about three health insurance companies and they're not riding in the same places. They're saying, okay, Anthem, you can have Taylor County and Adair County and Humana, we're gonna take Marion County and we'll charge whatever we want instead of bidding against each other. So we have to have more competition in the right. healthcare and, and that's another thing uh, to be able to allow health insurance companies to cross the state lines. These are things we've been frantically trying to make happen to improve the healthcare situation in America. Mm -hmm. Uh, in your roughly two years in Congress, soon to be two years, yeah. uh, what would you say is the greatest accomplishment that's mm -hmm. happened? And uh, similarly, or uh, uh, the greatest disappointment right. that you've experienced? Uh, that, with, without doubt, the greatest accomplishment has been the fact that we've improved the business climate. And we've mm -hmm. done that two ways. First, we reduced taxes. That was in December. And not just taxes on businesses, but taxes on individuals. Even people that, that work at a factory that get a W-2 and they go to H&R Block and they, they just file and the, what's called and take the standard deduction. We doubled the standard deduction. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you, you did not pay federal taxes on the first $12,000 of income. Now it's twenty four. So the first $24,000 is non-taxable. If you have a, a child or two, mm -hmm. you get the child tax credit. If you have a mortgage on your home, you still deduct that mortgage, mortgage interest. So if you make 28, if you're, you're in a working middle class, uh, even you know working poor, you make $28,000, you're probably not gonna pay a penny of federal tax mm -hmm. now. So that's been a positive thing, not just for the businesses, but for the workers. And I think that's fueling the economy. It doesn't, you can't just fuel the strong economy by the businesses right. and hope that it trickles down. Individuals have to have more money to spend at the retailers, on a, on a vehicle, on, on things for their children. So 
we, we focused on cutting taxes. We've also focused on reducing the regulatory burden. Mm -hmm. The Obama administration put a lot of burdensome regulations on the private sector, not just the coal industry, which we see a lot on television, in which I have a lot of coal mines in western Kentucky, but also on agriculture with uh, a regulation called Waters of the U.S. Right. that we eliminated. Uh, the community banks were straddled with a, a law called Dodd-Frank that we repealed for the community banks. So we've taken lots of industries that were in duress and we have focused on what was holding them back and we've reduced the regulatory burden. So the biggest accomplishments, what we've done with reducing regulations, reducing taxes, to, to be able to see what we had just a, a few weeks ago, record growth for the, for the quarter, 4.1% GDP. President Trump thinks we can get that up to 5%. If we have 5% growth in mm -hmm. this country, we're operating on every cylinder now, and that, mm -hmm. that's really good. The biggest disappointment would be healthcare, okay. because healthcare is the biggest problem in America, in my opinion. Uh, I know my wife and I, we pay $1,200 a month for health insurance. We have the highest deductibles and co-pays possible. My boy broke his arm playing baseball. Insurance didn't cover a penny of that. So I know what healthcare is doing, and, mm -hmm. I, and we, we probably have it a lot better than the, the majority right. of people. Sure. So we've got to, get healthcare under under control. There are too few insurance companies. They're gouging the consumer. The prescription drug prices are are being manipulated and monopolized by a few drug companies. The drug right. companies are coming in buying the prescription or buying the generic drug companies out, creating huge spikes in, in prescription drug prices. So uh, it, it's unfair to the American consumer what we're having to pay for healthcare compared to other countries. So there are some things that, that can be done to improve healthcare. You know, when you have a liberal like Bernie Sanders or Maxine Waters say, oh, well, let's just have Medicare for all, somebody has to pay for that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. So we have to have a consumer driven, market driven solution to healthcare, and that's what I'm working on. You have obviously a good relationship with President Trump. Yes. Uh, in the current administration. Uh, what, what is the most positive thing you could say about him? But also, I need to ask you the most disappointing right. uh, thing, or if you were critiquing him, right. what would you say is his biggest problem or weakness? Yeah. And then what words of advice right. would you give him right. policy-wise? Right. Well, I think the most positive thing is he's very popular in my district. Mm -hmm. uh, he, Recently, I, I saw a poll where he had 73% approval rating. That's pretty amazing. Dr. Cheney, that would be the highest in mm -hmm. America. Uh, mm -hmm. There are 435 House districts. I would put mine up against any House mm -hmm. district in America with Trump's approval rating. Now, the 27% that disapprove of him, they really disapprove mm -hmm. of him. It's either love or hate. I've never seen, I thought Obama was a mm -hmm. kind of polarizing figure, but uh, Trump is as well, and I think that that's going to be the trend moving forward. It's just uh, a lot of things contribute to that. The 24-hour news cycle right. with, the, with the conservative outlets, uh, liberal outlets are just always uh, really intensifying mm -hmm. the hostility in America. But I think that the president's very popular in the district. I like his, his style for the most part. I think that he's really trying to help working men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the, the tariff situation, that nobody likes the fact that we're in the tariff situation, but I think most people would agree that we have to do something about China or we're not going to have manufacturing. Is China the biggest, China's the biggest obstacle problem. to Absolutely. free trade? Absolutely. You see on the news, Russia's our problem. That's not our mm -hmm. problem. We don't do any trade with Russia. Russia's right. not a military threat. China is a threat. They're a threat militarily. Mm -hmm. They're a threat through trade, they're a, tre a threat through cyber, uh, cyber warfare. We have problems with China, and the last three presidents, Republican and Democrat, have turned a blind eye. Uh, President Trump's doing what he said he would do, and he's standing up to, to China. Now, I don't like the fact that agriculture and right. a lot of our industries in the first district seem to be on the front lines of this trade war, but it's something that I think it has to be done we have to negotiate a free and fair trade deal with China. How, it, how much of this, Congressman, do you think is 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 a uh, negotiating posture on the part of the president versus a commitment to carrying through with it regardless of the cost? Yeah. Well, or is it a combination? I think 
I think that he's 100% serious about it. Mm -hmm. Anytime he's put, he started off with the tariffs on steel and aluminum. Mm -hmm. China came back and they said, well, we're going to put tariffs on soybeans and, and, you know, lots of other products that you export to China, that China imports from America. And it's grown and every week, it seems like there are a hundred new items that were mm -hmm. added to the tariff list. So I think the, the, uh, phase where you're, you're, you're bluffing is over with. I think that mm -hmm. we're in a full-fledged, uh, serious potential trade war now. Well, would you advise President maybe to cut down on the tweets? I have, <laughs> and, and I've been in a room with, mm -hmm. with a lot of my colleagues in Congress and mm -hmm. say, Mr. President, we think that you would solve mm -hmm. a lot of your problems if you would not tweet as often. And, and I mean, it, we could, I don't think we made it to the elevator when he was tweeting again, you know, so <laughs> it's, this guy's going to tweet. That's his what, style. What do you think is his appeal? I mean, let, let's be honest. He's yeah. he, his approach to governing, his approach to running for president, uh, violates every political mm -hmm. uh, right. c c political uh, campaign manager's uh, recommendations. Right. The the ten ways to get elected, yeah. so to speak. He violated probably nine of the ten. At least, maybe yeah. ten. Yeah, yeah. What, what is the key to his success? I think that. People look at him and they do not see a politician. Mm -hmm. And I think that in America, Americans have grown and are still sick and tired of politicians. They're sick and tired of politically correct politicians that talk in sound bites, mm -hmm. that you ask them a question, they'll give you an answer, but it has nothing to do with the question you ask. And they're stiff and they do what they're supposed to do and they seem like they're representing the special interest and not them. Mm -hmm. This is a guy that's definitely not a politician. He's as outside the box as you can possibly be. He uh, is in appearance to the majority of the people in America not beholden to special interest. Mm -hmm. He is trying to do what he said he would do. He said he would stand up to China. Every president says they're gonna stand up China, then they never do. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that he was going to build the wall and he's you know committed to building the wall he's, he said recently he's going to shut the government down if we don't build the wall so this is a president that would that we be wise do you think i do not think yeah, it would be to wise shut down the government right. aside and, from and the wall no 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 yeah. and, and i voted in the house to mm -hmm. build the wall i mean that's mm -hmm. a public right. record Pre that's an important thing for the president uh, we had an appropriate a homeland security appropriations bill that mm -hmm. funded about 40% of the wall, which it's going to have to be built in two or three phases. Um, and it'll take a while to build sure. the wall. I mean, it's a long, it's not a straight line and it's some rough terrain uh, mm -hmm. along the Rio Grande River. But you've got a, a, uh, a deal where it can pass this house, but you cannot get 60 votes in the Senate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to build the wall. Some people have said, well, you should, Senator McConnell should change the rules. Both McConnell and Paul are against changing the rules right. to 50. But I'll tell you this, I don't think they can get to 50 on building the wall in mm -hmm. the Senate. You have some, most of the rep Republican representatives that are in the majority of the House are, are very conservative. I consider myself very conservative. Mm -hmm. In the Senate, they're more moderate. And when you talk about senators like Susan Collins right. in, in Maine, uh, she is closer at least moderate, maybe liberal, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a different mindset. Uh, Murkowski in, in Alaska, you know, you, you you have a a very more center ideology than you mm -hmm. do in the House. The House is more right, center right. This is more moderate, more right down the center. And I don't think that for whatever reason the votes are there in the Senate. So it's it's a good thing to stand for what you what you believe in, but at the end of the day, he has to get the vote. So the problem with the wall, and a lot of people ask that, I do town halls all the time, and that's the first question that, that mm -hmm. people ask. It's it's the Senate that can't get the votes to pass to, to, to pass a bill to fund the wall. Mm -hmm. we, we did it in the House, it barely passed, but, but the problem's getting to 60 or 50 in the Senate. Are you concerned about the level of uh, rhetoric that mm -hmm. we're hearing uh, from the right as well yes, as the left. Absolutely. I mean, uh, terms like revolution yes. and and yes. and just terms that uh, uh, play to the emotions right. of absolutely. people, not to the rational Do thinking of people. Dr. Channing, I, I, of course, the po the politicians are a big part of Washington D.C., mm -hmm. but the media, not 
you're, this is a good civil conversation. Sure. We're having a good, good, thorough conversation here. But if you go on MSNBC, right. CNN, or Fox, right. they want you to talk in sound bites, and they want the ones that are mm -hmm. going to go on there mm -hmm. that are going to throw the red meat, mm -hmm. the most right-wing radical Republicans right. they can get, and the most left-wing radical Democrats they mm -hmm. can get, because that triggers ratings. Right. And and what's happening is the average American is just watching this news cycle, right. this 24-hour news cycle, and it's building, and, and there you know there's more hostility at the town halls. That's making the politicians more hostile. And I blame, you know, there, there are a lot of problems in Washington, the, the, certainly the politicians, the special interest. But the but the 24-hour news cycle, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's getting more entertainment oriented than news oriented right. and it's more opinion oriented you know you, the old newspapers you would have the first three or four pages right. and they would be the news right. fair and balanced and then the last page would be the opinion section exactly well that was the last page now the mm -hmm. opinion section's the front page and and the the news that's being reported is is very biased and and very dramatic to where um, it, like for example, my, my biggest problem with Fox, and I watch Fox, that's right. the TV station I watch when I watch 24 mm -hmm. hour news, but Fox makes it sound like every Republican wants President Trump to fail. That's not true. I mm -hmm. want President Trump to succeed, mm -hmm. and I would say 95% of the Republicans in Congress want the President to, su to succeed. You have a Bob Corker, you, you have a Jeff Flake, that want to see probably that are against everything President mm -hmm. Trump stands for. Those are two Republicans in the Senate. Well, that's all they talk about mm -hmm. on Fox. And they make it sound like we all want right. the president to fail. And, and the president has overwhelming support in the United States Congress on the Republican side. He doesn't have any support on the mm -hmm. Democrat side. But that's something that doesn't get conveyed on, on mm -hmm. Fox. So I feel like uh, that's kind of fueling the civil discourse we're having yep. in America right now. Uh, what needs to be done, what is being done, and then needs to be done in addition to protect our election system, mm -hmm. right. our, our, our system of free and open elections? I think we would all agree mm -hmm. there's been undue influence Absolutely. from outside interest, yes. yep. uh, whomever, Russians, yes. Chinese, yep. North Koreans, yep. uh, and, and, and coupled to that is this whole thing of cyber warfare. Right. What, what can we do? Well, what we have a problem. We have a problem in America. When I first took office a year and a half ago, I went to the Pentagon and they gave the freshmen that were interested a briefing, a full briefing through the Pentagon on our military. We have the strongest military mm -hmm. in the world. We have the best military soldiers. We have the best equipment. We have the best satellites. You know, we have the best military in the world, except on the cyber front. Mm -hmm. And we're not even in the top 10 countries with cyber strength. So we have a weakness mm -hmm. in our military, uh, in our whole uh, data information technology system in America. We are susceptible to being hacked. And you, you hear daily where something's hacked, our, our credit information, mm -hmm. our, uh, you know, try to hack the elections, social media accounts, emails hacked. Shutting down electrical right? grid. Electrical grid. Which is that's very, a huge would be a very problem, serious detrimental. major Problem. And the source of the overwhelming majority of these hacks are foreign countries. Mm -hmm. And China is at the top of the list. Russia is mm -hmm. a problem. There are countries that you would have to struggle to find on the globe, or I would have to mm -hmm. struggle. You probably know Uzbekistan. I mean, you've got a lot mm -hmm. of little countries that, that are you know, third world countries, but they have superior cyber mm -hmm. uh, hackers. And as we speak, we're trying to get caught up with our cybersecurity from a military standpoint, but we're way behind. And I mm -hmm. think you're seeing a lot of emphasis now on trying to ensure that we have uh, safe elections this mm -hmm. fall that are not uh, hacked. More and more electronic voting now. Right. You know, used to with the old machines that we voted on in Cumberland and Monroe County, that right. wasn't a problem. The old paper ballots, which I think there should always be a paper trail in an election, but more and more are electronic voting and, and that susceptible to being hacked. We're about out of time. What would you consider to be the number one problem facing the first congressional district? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's always the economy and there are pockets of the first congressional district that are, that are doing well, but the majority of the first district are rural. Mm -hmm. And 
that's why I think it's important that we stand up to China. If we're going to rebuild rural America, right. we have to have manufacturing jobs, mm -hmm. good paying manufacturing jobs that provide a living, that pay a living wage, that provide health care, that provide a retirement. And we're not going to be able to uh, recruit those manufacturing jobs to rural America if we can't compete with China. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you look at what can be done in rural America, you, you have to have, like we had when I was growing up, whether it was Maribone or Gamelia right. or, 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 or wherever, there's every little community had a little factory. Exactly. And the people work mm -hmm. there. Most farmers are part-time farmers or their spouses work for off-farm income and they need health insurance and things like that. We've got to be able to have manufacturing in America. We mm -hmm. can't keep buying everything made in other countries. We have to make stuff here. Warren mm -hmm. Buffett says that. And I think the next boom in manufacturing could happen in rural America. So I'm hopeful that we can get a positive resolution. Is your district uh, the most rural district in America? It's, or it's, close to it's, it? It's the most rural district mm -hmm. in America. Now there are states like North, uh, North Dakota, Montana, they have one at-large district, right. but it's the, the biggest geographic district in mm -hmm. the state that has more than one congressional district. And it is probably the most rural in America. Congressman James Comer, thank you, sir, thank for your you, time. Dr. God bless you and be yeah. safe along the trail. Thank you, sir. This is John Chowning with U.S. Representative James Comer. As our guest this week, thanking you for watching and listening. Dialogue on public issues. Thank you. Mm -hmm.